Thank you. I'm super excited to be here at this interdisciplinary event and also to be in the same um, symposium with Rebecca and Laurie. So as Le Rebecca and Laurie emphasized, theory of mind is this capacity humans have to be able to attribute mental states to other people, to understand what other people are thinking, feeling, intending, and so forth. And as we saw in Rebecca's talk, one really important aspect of theory of mind is that we can use it to predict what other people are going to do. So I'm trying to make a guess about what you're going to do. If I knew what mental states you have, then I can make a better guess about what you're going to be doing next. But a really important fact about theory of mind is that we don't only use it in that way. Also, it seems to be intertwined in a really important way with our capacity for making moral judgments. So if we think now about these two capacities we have, the capacity to think about what's going on in other people's minds, and the capacity to make moral judgments about other people, there seems to be some really important connection between the two. And the question now arises, what is that connection? So the first kind of connection you might think of, which is the one that was really emphasized in Rebecca's excellent talk, is this one, that our judgments about what's going on in other people's minds affect our moral judgments about other people. So just to give you a sense of that kind of thing, this very important process, consider a few simple cases. So this is the police officer who shot Terence Crutcher. And now you might wonder about what was going on in her mind at the time that, you, that she did this. So one thought you might have is, maybe she was just impartially looking at the evidence and she just thought that this person posed a threat. Or another thought you might have is about what's going on in her mind is you might think she was being biased in some way by a sort of racial animus in this case. And then depending on which thing you think was going on in her mind, you might make really different moral judgments about her. On the, if you think the first thing is going on in her mind, you might think she's much less blameworthy than if you thought the second one was going. Or to take another case, if you consider Donald Trump, there's the famous case in which he referred to, a, uh, was talking about a journalist, and she, he said that she had blood coming out of her wherever. And now, Trump claimed that what was going on in his mind at that time is that he was thinking about blood coming out of her ears. If you thought that was right, if you thought that really was what was going on in his mind, then you think she's much less blameworthy than if you had other hypotheses about what he might have been thinking of. <laughs> so the, this just summarizes this pretty straightforward kind of relation between theory of mind and moral judgment. This straightforward relation is when we're trying to make moral judgments, we often care what's going on in someone else's mind. Depending on which thing we think is going on in their mind, we're going to have different judgments about whether that person deserves blame, praise, and so forth. What I want to suggest today is that there's also another relation between theory of mind and moral judgment, a relation that's in many ways much more surprising. And this is, not only do our judgments of what's in other people's minds affect our moral judgments, also the relation goes in the other way. Sometimes our moral judgments actually affect what our intuitions about what's going on in other people's minds. So our judgment about what other people believe, intend, know, and so forth, can actually be affected by our moral judgments, our judgments about what is morally right and morally wrong. So over the past 10 years or so, there's been this huge exploration of this topic that's involved all sorts of different kinds of mental states. So people have been interested in attributions of knowledge, of happiness, of weakness of will, of desire, all these different things. And in each case, people have found the way that we attribute these things to other people in a surprising way involves making moral judgments about other people. But of course, I can't talk about all of these different examples today. So today, I'm just going to be talking about two. So the two I'm going to be talking about are the ways that we attribute intentions to other people and the way that we make judgments about other people's true selves. So intention and true self. So my talk's going to be a little bit shorter than the other two. So instead of just talking all the way through, I'll take two questions or so after the one about intention and then go on to true self. So let's think first about this concept, concept of doing something intentionally. So this is just a really straightforward concept that we use all the time in our lives. It's the concept we use to make the distinction between, for example, when you're hammering a nail, and you just hammer in a nail, you did it on purpose. And when you're trying to hammer in a nail, and you accidentally bring the hammer down on your own finger, then you did it accidentally, unintentionally, not on purpose. So what we want to understand now is, what is the nature of the relationship between this notion, the notion of intentional action, and our moral judgments? When you first think about this kind of idea, there's something that sort of immediately comes to mind. And that is that, just in a very obvious way, our judgments about other people's intentions affect our moral judgments about other people. So if you're trying to figure out whether someone deserves praise or blame for the thing that they do, you're going to think they deserve more praise or more blame if you think they did it intentionally, that they did it on purpose, than if you think that they did it unintentionally. There's been an enormous amount of exploration of this topic, really fascinating discoveries about it. But the basic phenomenon, the fact that our judgments about intentional action affect our moral judgments, which might seem like a pretty obvious one. But the suggestion I want to make now is that the effect also goes in the opposite direction. So people's moral judgments, their judgments about whether what the person did was morally right or wrong, can actually just affect what might seem like a pretty straightforward factual judgment, the judgment as to whether they did it on purpose or not on purpose. So there have been many different studies about this kind of phenomenon. But today, just to give you a kind of sense of what it's all about, I'm just going to talk about one particular case. So in this very simple experiment, participants were randomly assigned to one of two conditions. 
the participants in the harm condition thus got the following vignette. So these participants were just told the following. The vice president of a company went to the chairman of the board and said, we're thinking of starting a new program. It will help us increase profits, but it will also harm the environment. The chairman of the board answered, I don't care at all about harming the environment. I just want to make as much profit as I can, so let's start the new program. They started the new program, and sure enough, the environment was harmed. So think a moment, for a moment about this vignette. And then participants just got this really simple question. Just do you agree or disagree with the sentence? The chairman of the board harmed the environment intentionally. So did he do it on purpose? Did he on purpose harm the environment? So let's just run the experiment right now. How many people say, yeah, he did it intentionally? And how many people say, no, he did it unintentionally? Okay, so when you first think about this case, you might think, well, it's pretty obvious why I'm saying this. The reason I'm saying this is because he knew full well that he was gonna harm the environment, and he went ahead and did this anyway. So it's just a purely factual judgment about this case. He knew what the effect was going to be. He decided to do it anyway. That's why we say that he did it intentionally. But what I want to suggest now is that maybe something else is going on. Maybe it's not just the fact that he knew. It's the fact that you think harming the environment is something bad. It's the fact that you're making this moral judgment, thinking there's something bad about harming the environment. And the way we can see whether that's true is just by trying to construct a different case that's almost exactly the same, except for the moral valence of the outcome changes. So this new case we'll call the help condition, just word for word, exactly the same as the previous case. We're just changing the word harm to help. So here it goes. The vice president of a company went to the chairman of the board and said, we're thinking of starting a new program. It will help us increase profits and it will also help the environment. The chairman of the board, board answered, I don't care at all about helping the environment. I just want to make as much profit as I can. So let's start the new program. They started the new program and sure enough, the environment was helped. And then participants just got this sort of analogous kind of question. So do you agree or disagree with the following statement? The chairman of the board helped the environment intentionally. So let's just try it again. How many people say yes, he helped the environment intentionally? And how many people, how many people say no, he harmed the environment, helped the environment unintentionally? So if you try this on ordinary folks, you get exactly the same kind of asymmetry. So people in the first case tend to say he acted intentionally, and in the second case they acted, say that he acted unintentionally. But notice that in all of the sort of respects that you might think are relevant for the question about whether someone did something intentionally, these cases are exactly the same. In both cases, the agent knew that the outcome was going to rise. In both cases, the agent wasn't at all trying to bring about the outcome, but was just trying to make profits. The difference between the two is just something moral. It's just the difference between a case in which the outcome is something bad and a case in which the outcome is something good. So what this result seems to suggest is somehow the moral status of the outcome, whether it's something morally good or morally bad, is having an effect on something that you might think has nothing to do with morality. Just this straightforward question as to whether he did it intentionally. So over the years, there have been many further studies that sort of further explore this phenomenon. I'm just going to talk here really briefly about four. So first of all, when this um, phenomenon was first um, uncovered, many people thought maybe what was going on in this case had something to do with the emotional reaction that participants have. So maybe when you hear about this CEO who harms the environment, you just think, that bastard, why is he doing that? And then maybe this emotional reaction you have, this kind of sense of visceral distaste for this person, is clouding your judgment, interfering with your ability to use theory of mind in the way that you normally would. So to address this question, whether that's actually right, Leah and Young, whose work we've also seen in some of these previous presentations, decided to try out the same experiment, but this time on participants who had lesions to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. So these are participants who have lesions to a brain region that's involved in kind of integrating emotion into your decision making, and on other tasks that involve a kind of emotional impact on people's moral decisions, you see a very different response in these participants. But despite their massive deficits in this kind of capacity, these participants responded exactly the same way. Just like all of you did, they said, the person harmed intentionally, but helped unintentionally. And in subsequent work, actually, Abigail Baird has shown that even psychopaths show this tendency. So participants who are extremely, extremely low in the tendency to have this kind of emotional reaction, a kind of compassion for other people's suffering, a sort of emotional reaction that you would have toward morally wrong acts, still show this asymmetry. They still say morally bad things are intentional, morally good things are unintentional. A second point of thought that a number of people had is maybe participants aren't just directly answering the question that they were asked. Maybe what they're doing is something more sophisticated. They're engaged in this kind of complex, pragmatic processing where they're thinking, well, what's the kind of question, the answer that the person really wanted to know about? They just didn't want to know about this sort of straightforward thing, was it intentional or unintentional? Maybe even though that's the word that they asked, what they're really trying to get at is, was the person to blame for it or something else more complex? So to get at that question, does it have to do with this complex kind of non-literal interpretation of the question? Tiziana Zala tried to rerun the experiment, but this time on participants who have Asperger's syndrome. 
So these are participants who show a real inability to sort of look beyond the literal question you asked to get at what you were really after. But despite their deficit in that kind of processing, they still show exactly the same pattern of results. So they still tend to say, he harmed the environment intentionally, but he helped the environment unintentionally, indicating, again, that it's not a matter of this sort of external factor, not emotions clouding your judgment, not pragmatic processes clouding your judgment. Maybe it really is that people's moral judgments are affecting their theory of mind. So a second problem, third kind of problem that you might begin to wonder about is whether individual differences in people's own moral judgments are going to lead to corresponding changes in people's judgments about whether you did something intentionally. So in the kind of case that we're talking about so far, maybe everyone in this room thinks harm in the environment is bad, help in the environment is good. But suppose I took a case where some of you think it's morally bad and some of you think it's morally good. In that case, the theory should predict that the ones who think it's morally bad should say it's intentional. And even though it's the very same action we're talking about, the ones who think it's morally good should say it's unintentional. So Peter Ditto and colleagues ran a whole series of studies to kind of explore that. I'll just give you one example. So this was during the Iraq War. And so Ditto and colleagues asked the following question. Suppose that the United States government is thinking of bombing the Iraqi insurgents, but there are just some innocent Iraqis who just happen to be around there. The US government knows that thereby they're going to be killing the innocent Iraqis, but they're not doing that in order to kill the innocent Iraqis. They just want to kill the insurgents. So the question is, did they kill the innocent Iraqis intentionally? And the other condition, the Iraqi insurgents are trying to bomb the US soldiers, but they're just some innocent Americans who just happen to be around. The insurgents aren't actually trying to harm the innocent Americans. All they're trying to do is harm the soldiers, and they just realize these other Americans will be killed as well. Did the Iraq Iraqi insurgents kill them intentionally? So they ran this study on two groups of people, people who are very politically conservative and people who are politically liberal. The politically conservative said, the conservative participants said, the Americans unintentionally killed the innocent Iraqis, but the Iraqis intentionally killed the innocent Americans. As for the liberals, they said, the Americans intentionally killed the innocent Iraqis, but the Iraqis unintentionally killed the innocent Americans. So then finally, you might think we could sort of use this technique to get at moral judgments that people wouldn't openly admit that they're even making. So now if we ask people whether someone did something intentionally, it seems like that gives us a clue as to whether people are in some way thinking that it was morally bad. In certain cases, if we just ask you, do you think this thing is morally bad? You might say, absolutely not. I don't think that in any way. But maybe we can kind of get through that sort of initial barrier by using this other measure. Just, do you think it was done intentionally? So in a study by Yoel and Inbar and colleagues, researchers asked the um, participants about two different cases. So in one condition, participants were told, so the record company is trying to increase sales of this album. So they come out with a new music video. Then the assistant says to the, you know, the director, wait, if you look at the images in this music video, it's really going to encourage gay people to French kiss on the street. And the director of the video says, I don't care at all about trying to encourage, of encouraging gay men to French kiss on the street. All I care about is increasing sales of this album. So let's release the video. So they release the video, and sure enough, it encourages gay men to French kiss on the street. In this case, did he encourage gay men to French kiss on the street intentionally? Then in the other condition, participants were told that the assistant says to the director, this video will encourage couples to French kiss on the street. Did he encourage couples to French kiss on the street intentionally? So to run on a very liberal sample of participants, if you ask them explicitly in each of these cases whether there's anything wrong with that, you see this interesting result that a, lot of, a fair number of participants say there is something wrong with encouraging couples to French kiss on the street, but if everyone absolutely insists there's never anything wrong with um, encouraging gay people to French kiss on the street. But despite that, if you use this implicit measure, the measure of just do they think it was done intentionally, you see the opposite pattern emerging. So people tend to say he unintentionally encouraged couples to French kiss on the street, but that he intentionally encouraged gay people to French kiss on the street, indicating that maybe even though people are openly saying that they find nothing wrong with this, there's something implicit in their judgments that's regarding this as in some way bad. Okay, that concludes the first module. Let's hear like maybe two questions, then I'll go to the next one. Yes. Do you, do you mean that the agent herself kind of regards it as having that cause? Yeah, so in the case in, in Britain, the, the perpetrator um, causes an environmental um, cost to this thing. Yeah. Yeah, this is an excellent point. So one thing you might think is, any, completely independent of any moral judgment that you make, you might be thinking that the chairman actually regards this as a cost. 
So to figure out whether that's right, you have to kind of tease apart those two things. The tease apart the, the relationship between whether you regard it as morally bad and whether the agent regards it as a cost. So one really nice study that explored this uses this kind of cartoonish character of a terrorist. So this terrorist recognizes that a bomb is going to be um, go off in a nightclub and kill all these Americans in the nightclub. So the um, terrorist thinks, well, that's really wonderful because all these Americans are evil. It's really great to hear that they're going to be killed. But then he discovers something, something new. His son, whom he loves dearly, is actually going to be in the nightclub on that very night. The only way that he can rescue his son is to defuse the bomb. But if he defuses the bomb, it's going to be saving all the Americans. So then he thinks, OK, what do I do in this situation? Morally, what I should do is just not do anything and then have these evil Americans be killed. But I love my son so much, I just have to throw morality to the wind and just defuse the bomb, and then I'm going to be saving the Americans. So in this case, what you see is your own moral judgment, where you presumably think saving the Americans is something good, is coming apart from what the agent thinks. The agent thinks that this is a cost. So if it was driven by the judgment by the agent that it's a cost, you should expect the people to say it's in, that he intentionally saved the Americans. If it's driven by your judgment of what's morally right, then you should expect people to say he unintentionally saved the Americans. What you actually find is that people say he unintentionally saved the Americans, indicating it's not about our judgment about, our guess about what the agent thinks, it's about our judgment about whether this really is morally good or morally bad. Okay, excellent question. Is there one other? Yes. Like you yourself, when you looked at these cases, you, you thought, it doesn't seem like there's any difference to you, even though you could see from the room that other people were seeing a difference. There's a really interesting question as to why we get these individual differences. So it's, as you see from the original graph, it's not as though 100% of people are seeing that it's intentional in the harm case. Some people aren't. So why are people sometimes saying that it's unintentional? Or why are people sometimes in the help case saying that it is intentional? Why are people different from each other? And there's been a lot of interesting studies about this thing. So one answer that might seem obvious uh, at, when, you, when you put it this way is just that different people care to different degrees about whatever thing is at stake in each individual case. So some people just care more about the environment, other people will care more about corporate profits, and that actually predicts whether you regard this as intentional or unintentional. But there's another thing that I think is really deeper, which is if you look at individual differences in this tendency to just moralize things, to sort of have this need to make judgments about things, those actually predict this. So it might be that some people just have a way of looking at the world where they're just really trying to understand just what actually happened. And other people have a way of looking at the world where whenever they see something, they feel a need to make more of a moral judgment about it. And if you're not getting the same intuition that other people in the room were, it might be that you are one of those people who looks at the world in this different way, where you're just trying to make sense of like what actually happened. You don't feel in the same way this sense of always looking at the world and trying to make a moral judgment about it. Is this morally good or is it morally bad? OK, with that, we're changing to the next module. So, Next module is about this other very different notion, this notion of the true self, notion of something like who you really are deep down inside. So I think maybe the best way of getting a sense of which thing I'm talking about here is just to give an example. So this guy here is Mark Pierpont. So Mark Pierpont was at one time a really important figure in this evangelical movement to cure gay people of their homosexuality. So you travel around the world bringing people this message that homosexuality is a sin, but that you can be rescued from that sin through the power of Jesus. But you know, Mark Pierpont actually had a problem, which was that he himself was actually gay. So as he was traveling around the world, bringing people this message, he was always had this desire to actually be with another man. And he was struggling with that. He thought it was this terrible thing about himself. He hated that aspect of himself. And he was always involved in this internal struggle between these two parts of himself. And then he went through the struggle for a long time. And then eventually he resolved the struggle by um, leaving the church and just actually ended up marrying another man. So now think about the time before he left the church when he was involved in this kind of internal struggle, two different parts of him at war with each other. How should we understand his self in those cases? I think a lot of people have this sense, we shouldn't think of those two desires as just being kind of on a par. Instead, we should think of his self as having these different aspects. There's something like the core of his self, who he most truly is, who he is deep down. And then there are other things about his self that are aspects of himself, but are sort of more superficial aspects of himself, not who he mo himself most truly is. So for example, you might think, Deep down in the core of himself is desire to be with another man. But then there's just this weird thing he happens to have that he thinks that that's morally wrong. If he could only get rid of this belief that this is morally wrong, he'd be able to more fully express the person that he himself most truly was all along. Or you might think about it the opposite way. You might think, 
deep down in the core of his self, in his true self, is this belief that homosexuality is morally wrong. But then there's this other weird thing he happens to have, that he has a desire to be with another man. If he could only get rid of that, he'd be able to express the person that he himself most truly was all along. So the question now is, how do we decide which of these two aspects of him really is his true self? And if you turn to the philosophical literature, there's often a suggestion that the way we're going to make this decision is by thinking about different aspects of the mind, different parts of the mind. We're going to ask the question, which part of the mind is the part of the mind that sort of represents the true self? So one idea, going all the way back to Aristotle, who developed it in a particular kind of way, and then up to the present, is this idea that maybe there's some sense in which your capacity for judgment, for reasoning, for reflection, something like that, that's really your true self. So if you have a desire to do something, but then on reflection you think, that's really wrong, it's that part of you that reflects and thinks about what's really right and wrong. That part of you is your true self. So if you thought that, you might think, the part of Mark Pierpont that's really his true self is this part, the part that believes that homosexuality is morally wrong. If he could only get rid of this desire that's moving against what he himself judges to be right, he'd be able to more fully express who he himself really truly is all about. Or another kind of view you might have is that ultimately, it's your emotions that are really your true self. So you might think, the time when your true self most fully comes out is when you're completely drunk or you're just overcome with emotion, unable to control yourself. It's then that the person who's the real you actually emerges. And if you thought that, then you might think that his desire to be with another man, that's his true self. Because that's the thing that sort of he felt most viscerally or emotionally. So each of these might seem like a pretty plausible view. But what I'm going to suggest is that people's ordinary way of understanding this, the self isn't like either of these at all. Instead, it has this quality that we were talking about earlier. It's something that's infused with a certain kind of moral judgment. So the ordinary way we decide which part of you is your true self is not just by asking which part is due to your moral judgment or which part is due to your emotion. Rather, it's by asking which part of you is the part that's really the morally good part. So we pick out the part of you that we regard as the morally good part, and we think it's that part of you that's really your true self. So for example, suppose that you folks have different views about which part of me is the good part. Some of you think this part's the good part. Some of you think that part is the good part then what we should predict is that different people would have then correspondingly different views about which part of me is my true self. So again, we did lots of different experiments to address this idea, but again, I'm just going to talk about just one as an illustration. So in this case, we gave participants this uh, vignette about this real guy, Mark Pierpont, and we, so participants were given the following story. Mark is an evangelical Christian. He believes that homosexuality is morally wrong. In fact, Mark now leads a seminar in which he coaches homosexuals about the techniques they can use to resist their attraction to people of the same sex. However, Mark himself is attracted to other men. He openly acknowledges this to other people and discusses it as part of his own personal struggle. And then participants were then just given the exact um, little pictures that I used in illustrating the theory to begin with. So they were asked to describe the, which one of these pictures best describes sort of Mark's true self. So one possible idea is deep down in his true self, is this feeling that's drawing him to be with another man. But then he also has this belief that that's morally wrong. If only he could get rid of that belief, he'd be able to express the person that he himself really is all along. Or you might think the opposite. Deep down in his true self is the belief that it's morally wrong. But then he also has this feeling that's drawing him to be with another man. If he could only get rid of that feeling, he'd be able to express the person that he himself most truly was all along. Or neither of them is his true self. They're both not part of his true self, or both of them are part of his true self. So again, let's just run the experiment right now. So just reflect for a moment. Which of these four is the right answer? So just everyone thinks for a second. Okay, how many people say the first one? How many people say the second one? How many people say the third one? And how many people say the fourth one? Okay, so in addition to this dependent measure, we also concluded an individual difference measure, so that gets at differences between different kinds of people. Just one item long, it's just would you describe yourself as a liberal or as a conservative? So then we can look at the results separately for liberals and for conservatives. And what we find is, for liberals, the modal answer, that is to say the answer that's most commonly given, is the feelings are the true self. Deep down in Mark's true self is the desire to be with another man. Of course, he has this judgment that that's morally wrong. But that judgment's just getting in the way of his ability to express who he really is. If he could just only get rid of that judgment, he'd be able to more fully express the person that Mark Pierpont really was all along. Actually, after we ran the study, Mark Pierpont got in touch with me, and he told me that is the right answer. The, the, <laughs> that one. Okay, so then, um, the, then if you look at the conservatives, what you find is a different pattern of responses. What you find is that the modal answer is both. Both the emotions and the belief are part of the true self. So putting these things another way, everyone thinks your emotions are part of your true self. 
As for whether the belief is part of your true self, it depends on whether they think the belief is good. People who think that this judgment that homosexuality is morally wrong is a good judgment to make, they think it is part of your true self. People who think it's a bad judgment to make, they just tend to say that it's not part of your true self. But of course, there's also another condition. Participants in the other condition got, just got the reverse story of the actual character, Mark Pierpont. So they were told, Mark is a secular humanist. He believes that homosexuality is perfectly acceptable. In fact, Mark leads a seminar in which he coaches people about techniques they can use to resist their negative feelings about people who are attracted to the same sex. However, Mark himself has a negative feeling about same-sex couples. He openly acknowledges this to other people and discusses it as part of his own personal struggle. So we can just take a look at this for a second. Okay, so the same question. So one possibility is, deep down in Mark's true self is this feeling of this sort of uh, negative feeling toward gay people, but then there's just this belief he happens to have that, that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally. If only he could get rid of that belief, he'd be able to more fully express his true self. Or deep down is this belief that people of all sexual orientations should be treated equally. But then there's just this weird thing that he happens to have these emotions that are getting in the way of him expressing that. If only he could get rid of those emotions to be able to more fully express the person he was all along. Or neither of them is part of his true self, or they both are part of his true self. Okay, you can reflect for a second. Okay, how many people say the first one? The second one? The third one? And the fourth one? Okay, so if we look now at the data, what we find is that in a certain sense, people are showing, just don't, don't worry about it, where people are showing the exact opposite pattern as the one that they showed in, for the previous study. Among the liberals, the modal response is both. Both of these things are part of your true self. Among the conservatives, by far, the modal response is only the feelings are part of your true self. That deep down in Mark's true self, there's this emotion calling him to the recognition that um, homosexuality is morally wrong, but then just today's politically correct culture is somehow like, blind to him to that fact. So in a, even though these responses are in a certain way the opposite, at a deeper, more abstract level, what you're seeing is exactly the same pattern that you observed in the other one. For people always say that your emotions are part of your true self, is the belief part of your true self? Well, if you think the belief is a morally good belief, as in this case the liberals do, then you think it is part of the true self. If you think the belief is not a, a, a morally good belief, that's a bad belief, then you think it's not part of the true self. So again, there have been all sorts of further studies that just sort of explore or extend this in various respects. So one of them was just to conceptually replicate. So you might worry that this just has something weird thing to do with just this one individual thing about homosexuality. So we try to with all sorts of different other cases that involve other things that liberals versus conservatives disagree about, and also other ways of measuring it, instead of having these little circles, using the words like who you are deep down or in your true self or whatever way we wanted to do it, you always get this same basic result. Second, we were worried, maybe what's going on in this case is that it's just some weird fact about contemporary Western culture that people show this. So maybe there's this sense in contemporary Western culture of that there's this thing, the self, which is sort of autonomous, separate from all other people, individual to you, and also this kind of rosy sense about people, that people are really wonderful in general. You might think this is something very idiosyncratic to our particular culture. So Julian de Freitas conducted a cross-cultural study in which he looked at, ran the same study, but in China, Russia, Colombia, and the United States. What you find is no difference between cultures. People in all of these different cultures t show this tendency to pick out the morally good parts of you and regard those as your true self. Then maybe more pressingly, you might have this worry about just misanthropy. So you might think, Maybe just in general, people tend to be pretty positive about other human beings. But maybe it's just that fact that most of us are pretty positive about human beings that leads us to show this effect. Some of us maybe have much more negative feelings about human, other human beings. And then those of us who are more negative about other people might not show this tendency. So to get at this, we use this individual difference measure of misanthropy. So people are just asked in a self-report measure how much they agree with statements like, you can't trust other people, other people are always out to get you, just basically statements indicating that they think other people are fundamentally awful. So then we have people who are very high on that measure, who are very misanthropic, people who are very low, who have a high kind of faith in humanity. So then all these participants received a story in which someone was caught between two things, between a morally good thing and a morally bad thing. So in one condition, participants were just asked, given that he's caught between these two things, which do you think he, thing do you predict he's actually going to do? What you find there, unsurprisingly, is that the people who are very high in faith of, in humanity say he's going to do the good thing. The people who are very high in misanthropy say, I predict he's going to do the bad thing. Then participants in the other condition were asked, regardless of which thing you think the person's actually going to do, which of these two things is the person's true self? And in that case, you see no effect of misanthropy. People who are high in misanthropy or low in misanthropy just universally say, the good thing is your true self. In other words, 
people who are very misanthropic think you're going to do the bad thing, and they think you're basically a terrible person. But the reason they think that is not that they think deep down there's something calling you to be bad, it's rather that they think deep down there's something ca calling you to be good, but you're just never going to listen to that. So finally, we are just wondering whether this thing that we observe has anything to do with human beings or with the mind in particular, or whether it's the application to human beings or the mind of some sort of much more general tendency. So we looked at this exact same kind of effect, but now looking at other objects, other than people or minds. So for example, suppose we look at scientific papers. So imagine a paper, it has some really good parts that are making this really important contribution to science, and then just some really like, crummy parts that contribute nothing at all and were just added, I don't know, to a PS review or three. And then we can now ask, what is the essence of this paper? What is this paper really all about? And what is like, not essential to this paper? And what we observe is that people think the good things about the paper are essential to the paper, and the bad things about the paper are not essential. And indeed, if you look at cases in which different people have different views about which parts of the object are the good parts, for example, where conservatives and liberals have opposite views, they show the same tendency that whichever parts you think are the good parts of this object, you think those parts are the essence of the object. So it seems like maybe what's going on here is that the reason people think that the part of the self that is the true self, the essence of the self, is the good part of the self, is not because of something very specific about how people think about the mind or the self, it's because people think, just quite generally, that the good things about anything are the essence of that thing. So, so far in this talk, I just talked about two particular examples, the case of intentional action and the case of the true self. In both cases, you see the same thing occurring, that this question that might have seemed like a purely scientific or factual question, people's judgments about it are actually affected by their moral judgments. And then what I really want to emphasize is that you see that exact same thing arising in numerous other cases other than the two that I just happened to mention today. So thinking more generally about the relationship between these two things, it seems like we have increasing reason to think that this relationship is really bi-directional. It's not just the fact, as Rebecca emphasized, for example, in her talk, that people's judgments about the mind affect their views about whether what someone did is morally good or morally bad, but also the other way, that your judgments about which things are morally good and which are morally bad actually affect your intuitions about what's going on in the other person's mind. Thanks.